Palestinians in northern Gaza are reporting fierce air and artillery strikes. This comes as Israeli troops, backed by tanks, pressed into the enclave with a ground assault. Meanwhile, thousands of people have broken into UN aid warehouses in Gaza, taking food and other supplies amid growing hunger and desperation. Gazans make a desperate dash for basic supplies. Raiding UN warehouses for flour and hygiene products, thousands rush to take whatever they can carry. The chaotic scenes a sign of growing despair. We have no flour, no aid, no water, not even toilets. Our houses were destroyed. No one cares about us. We appeal to the people of the world. All international powers are against us. We needed aid, and we wouldn't have done this if we weren't in need. The call for help comes as Palestinians face growing danger from Israel's ground offensive. Israel's military released these images of what it says are troops pushing into the north of the Gaza Strip as they try to eliminate the Hamas terrorist group and rescue more than 200 hostages. Thousands of Gazans are sheltering at the Al Quds Hospital amid the conflict. Now officials have been told to evacuate here too. The number of displaced people here is between 12 and 14,000. The figure changes every day. Counting the hospital departments and the intensive care unit, we have nearly 60 patients, as well as 800 injured, who are receiving treatment in the emergency department. Israeli strikes have already hit the area around the hospital, but some fear leaving isn't safe either. And despite the growing risk from air attacks, thousands of Palestinians are running out of places to run to. Let's bring in Toby Fricker here. He's a spokesperson for the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF. He joins us from Amman, Jordan. Toby, UNICEF has people on the ground in Gaza. What are they telling you about the situation there? Yeah, that's right. UNICEF has a team on the ground in the Gaza Strip. Uh, we lost communication for around 24 hours, but thankfully yesterday we were in touch again with the staff. What they're saying is the, the situation is, is really horrific. Uh, you know, we have a staff member called Nesma who has a four-year-old, seven-year-old girl. Uh, she was telling us about how, how petrified they are. Her four-year-old has been you know, resorting to, to sort of self-harm, pulling her hair, scratching her, her thighs because she's in such fear and the, and the trauma has affected her so much. But at the same time, they're struggling to get access to, to the essentials for life. So safe water, they've been drinking salty water now for around 10 days. Um, and her children have been saying, yeah, why can't I have you know, clean water, safe water again, regular water? Um, so the situation is, is, is horrific for, for every child uh, inside the Gaza Strip right now. There's a lot of concern, Toby, about what's happening in Gaza City, particularly at the Ashifa and Al Quds hospitals. What can you tell us about the situation there? Yeah, well, I think the hospitals have been under massive strain. I mean, even before this escalation, uh, the resources that hospitals would have had were limited uh, in terms of medical supplies, in terms of fuel. And now with this escalation, the situation is really horrific. First of all, they're treating people who are wounded, children who are wounded in, in, in attacks, but they're also treating people, particularly children, you know, in, in newborns, in incubators, and others for, for, for diseases and, and regular issues that happen all the time. Um, and now we, you know, we're extremely concerned from, from what we hear about the situation. You know, under the international humanitarian law, let's not forget that healthcare facilities are, are protected. And that's absolutely critical at this time, as the World Health Organization and others said, you know, moving any, anyone from any hospital is essentially a, a death sentence. A UN General Assembly resolution has called for an immediate ceasefire. That's among growing demands for a humanitarian pause in the fighting. Do you believe that we will see the opening of humanitarian corridors anytime soon? Well, we very much hope so, uh, that we'll see uh, increased uh, humanitarian access, safe, unimpeded access. That is not just one-off deliveries, but it's sustained. We really need to scale up the amount of life-saving supplies that can come in. 
Some have come in, but it's, it's certainly by no means enough given the immense needs that are inside the Gaza Strip. And that's why UNICEF, that's why the UN Secretary General keep calling for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire so that humanitarians can safely move supplies around. First of all, get them in and then move them around to reach uh, people who are in, in such need at this time. The focus of your organization, of course, is children. You described to us uh, a, an anecdote from one of, one of your uh, employees on the ground there. How are children in general being affected by this war? Because I understand the number of casualties among children is very high. Yeah, I mean, the number of casualties is, is horrific. I mean, more than 3,300 children have reportedly been killed. You know, another more than 6,300 children have reportedly been injured. You know, these, these numbers are, are immense and, and horrific. Uh, so first of all, what people are trying to do is, is protect the lives of their children. You know, the staff member I spoke about, Nesma, she's been, her, her first priority is to protect her children's lives, understandably, of course. But she's also trying to do a job, a humanitarian job, to support other children, to support other families who are also uh, having massive, massive needs. Um, so the situation is really horrific. And then, and then there's the access to to services, you know, to health services, to essential service, to that safe water that we spoke about. It's so critical to to keep children alive, and that's where we're at. It's really about life saving work. Toby, thank you very much for taking time to talk with us today. That was Toby Fricker, spokesperson for UNICEF, speaking to us from Amman, Jordan. Our correspondent, Rebecca Ritters, has the latest now on the Israeli ground offensive from Ashdod, close to the Gaza border in southern Israel. It's very, very hard to get access, um, impossible to get access, but very hard to know what's happening on the ground in Gaza. We've been witnessing or hearing at least a lot of the second phase of this war, this expanded ground invasion. We know that that's continued to expand. The Israeli military telling us again this morning that they're bolstering and expanding the, the scale and scope of this ground invasion. But exactly what's happening on the ground is, is very, very hard to verify. We're getting piecemeal bits of information. We we, we, it seems to appear, or there are reports, that Israeli military ground forces are now around about three kilometres inside that periphery of Gaza, uh, and there's hand-to-hand -hand combat going on. We've heard that there, were, uh, there was rather a big battle around the Erez crossing, um, but we don't know anything about numbers. The Israeli military saying that they uh, targeted many Hamas militants, but seeing in some of the Palestinian telegram, tr uh, telegram tra ch chats, excuse me, that also some soldiers were killed as well. But as I say, very hard to verify exactly what's happening on the inside. We know that there was a huge internet blackout for nearly 36 hours from Friday uh, into Sunday morning. And that made telecommunications obviously getting news out even more difficult. It was such a relief yesterday morning when we were finally able uh, to reach some of our colleagues there. But you can imagine the fear for the, the Gazans on the ground, not able to get in touch with their loved ones, not to be able to get in touch with emergency services when in fact there were airstrikes in their area. So uh, a very very serious, uh, terrible situation happening and just so difficult for us to be able to really know exactly what's happening. Now Hamas still has more than 200 hostages. Has there been any progress, Rebecca, in negotiating their release? Well, that number last night actually was risen uh, by, to 239 now. There's still 40 people missing, so that number could well rise again, Terry. The negotiations, we believe, are still ongoing. Qatar playing a very big role in those negotiations. But we also know that Qatar have said, or prior to the ground invasion, Qatar, Qatar uh, negotiators said that it would make negotiations very difficult if the Israeli military were to go in. They have now indeed done so. And so we don't know the state of those negotiations. There is some thought that perhaps a ground invasion may put pressure on Hamas, while we have other people saying that it's going to have the opposite effect. And in fact, the fact that the ground invasion has started means that getting those uh, hostages out alive is almost impossible. Once again, very hard to know, look into the crystal ball, but uh, the, a lot of pressure on the government from the families of those hostages, very upset, very on Friday when the ground invasion began, they were very upset. They were, you know, there was a meeting held with Prime Minister Benjamin, Benjamin Netanyahu to say that they were very angry that they weren't informed and the fact that this was happening meant that they, you know, almost had no, they were starting to lose hope that their loved ones would come out alive. So a very, very serious situation 
also for the hostages. You mentioned pressure, Rebecca. Uh, world leaders stepped up calls for desperately needed humanitarian aid to reach Gaza. What's Israel's response to that kind of international pressure? Well, we're slowly starting to see more aid go into Gaza, though nowhere near the amount that's needed for the people there on the ground. Uh, overnight, 33 tr more trucks were allowed in, but we're getting a saying, a some aid organisations saying that more than 80 a day are required for the needs of the people there and that we're just not seeing anything in those numbers. Now, in the beginning, Israel was very hesitant to allow any aid to go through at all. When President, US President Biden came, that deal, uh, he struck a deal that to uh, the, agree, the, get the Israelis to agree to start allowing aid coming in. We've been seeing that slowly trickle over, but a hell of a lot more is needed for what's the, the humanitarian catastrophe that's unfolding on the ground. Though, as I say, 33 trucks more came in overnight. And yesterday, the language from the military started to change. They started saying that they would be allowing more and more trucks to come through. Now, whether that's because they know that this is going to take a very long time and they simply have to allow aid in uh, so that the humanitarian catastrophe uh, doesn't completely explode on the ground, uh, you know, that could really say something about their tactics. But so far, not enough aid is getting through, but hopefully in the coming days that will be expanded. Rebecca, thank you very much. That was our correspondent, uh, Rebecca Ritters there in southern Israel. For more on Israel's incursion into Gaza, we can talk now to military analyst Mike Martin of King's College London. Mike, how do you see Israel's ground operation unfolding in the days and weeks ahead? Morning, Terry. Um, I, I see it unfolding very slowly because it's, it's quite a difficult thing to do to move into an urban area and to try and, you know, Israel said they want to destroy Hamas. That's a very difficult thing to do. And so what we've seen so far is Israel's crossed into the Gaza Strip, hasn't gone into the urban area, but is securing some areas outside of Gaza City itself. Now, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, he's been talking about uh, this being a, a long and difficult war. Does Israel have any clear exit strategy that you can see, Mike? Uh, I cannot see an Israeli uh, exit strategy. Um, these sorts of wars, uh, unconventional wars, always end with a political settlement. So they can't be solved militarily. And so the question for Israel is, OK, it's going to go in there. It will take out some Hamas tunnel, tunnels. It will kill some of the leadership, very unlikely to destroy Hamas. And then what? They've then still got the same problem that they started with. But there will be tens of thousands of Palestinians dead and probably thousands of Israelis as well. And so the question is, what is the political strategy that wraps around this military activity? At the moment, I see none. What about the hostages, Mike? Uh, there are more than 200 hostages being held by Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on the Israeli government to bring them out alive, obviously, from other countries as well. There are many foreign nationals there. Uh, how can Israel continue with its ground offensive and extract those hostages? I, I think it's very, very difficult. And again, I, I think we can... What we can read into the Israeli actions, and as you said, other other governments who've got their nationals as hostages are putting great pressure on the Israelis. But what I think we can read into the Israeli actions is that they don't care so much about the hostages. The hostages are not their primary aim here. Their primary aim is to do damage to Hamas. And I think on the side, I think Netanyahu is politically in trouble in Israel. So a ground offensive is a way of maintaining himself in power. I think this, the hostages are a secondary consideration. I think we can take that analysis from looking at the Israeli actions. If you were trying to get the hostages back, you wouldn't be launching a ground invasion. What about the signals coming from other players in the region, Mike? Because this conflict has hugely explosive potential for the region, doesn't it? It does. And, you know, just over the last few days, we've seen Erdogan of Turkey um, uh, making comments to crowds in Istanbul about going into Gaza. I mean, obviously, this is rhetoric. Uh, is uh, Iran as well with its proxies, uh, Hezbollah and others in the region. So it, it does have great potential 
for and really what the problem will come is is a mistake somebody will make a mistake there's so many players the situation is very ambiguous it's hard to tell what's going on we saw that with the the strike on the hospital last week but fake news whistles around all over the place and in those environments it's very easy for someone iran america israel turkey to make a mistake and then they've committed themselves to a much bigger conflict than than hitherto and that's the problem that we face at the moment mike thank you very much that was military analyst mike martin thank you